okay, the labor market's still strong, but it's starting to slow a little bit. That seems like really good news to me, Bob. You know, what do you feel about this jobs report that we just saw last week? Oh, wait a minute. I talk about labor. It's Labor Day already. What the heck happened? You know, I just, <laughs> the, the summer, what, when's the summer going to start? Now it's over, you're telling me? I can't believe it. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's appropriate. Labor Day uh, weekend fell with the labor report. Um, I think there's a lot to celebrate right now. Um, we're still seeing wages growing, growing over inflation now. Uh, we're starting to see a little bit of slack in the job market. It's not as tight. You know, if you look at the available jobs, it's come down a little bit. Still well above job openings that we saw pre-pandemic. But it's kind of like that, you know, that perfect not too hot, not too cold scenario where you have job availability, jobs are strong, but it's cooling off from just like the red hot economy or job market that we saw really over the course of the last year or two. You know, guys, I'm getting tired of watching Jerome Powell. I mean, it's, it's kind of like a Seinfeld episode. You know, yada, yada, yada. I mean, every <laughs> month, the same thing. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm up there visiting some clients of ours and uh, we had a conversation with them yesterday. And one of the things they commented on is the fact that, uh, you know, they're tired of hearing about how the Fed's going to up interest rates and how it's going to affect the markets. And, you know, we've been talking about this the last few weeks. You know, the last time the Fed did raise rates, the market didn't even burp. Now, that's uh, true, Chris. And, and, and we're getting good news on the economy and on the jobs market. You know, not only did the jolts number go down, right, the number of jobs opening dropped, uh, which is what the Fed was looking for. Uh, we have more people looking for jobs, which is what the Fed wanted to, to see happen. Um, and, you know, a number that didn't get talked about a lot was the quits number, right? Less people are quitting their job, which means there's probably not as many, you know, attractive other jobs out there to the one you currently have. Well, I guess you got to throw Ryan's resignation letter in the trash, Dad. I think I'm the most unemployable person in the firm. Let's be honest about that. If we had to be <laughs> really uh, true to my abilities. But no, no, look, I think bottom line is when we start looking onto the future, read the tea leaves, uh, you know, you're, you're starting to see inflation continue to moderate. Um, you know, we saw this past week, we saw the inflation number, the, the Fed's preferred measure of inflation came in about the same, what it was expected, still growing, but at a slower clip than it was a year ago. And the one component, the shelter component, which knows a lag, um, if you look at like rents in real time, they are coming down. That hasn't shown up in those numbers yet. So more than likely, you're going to see inflation numbers continue to come down through this year into next year. And you've got that coupled with the fact that the labor market's starting to cool. This is exactly what the Fed wants to see. And there's a good chance the Fed is not only not just done raising interest rates, they might even start lowering them next year. Yeah, I mean, if we really do see a slowdown, uh, which is what they're trying to accomplish, that it gets too slow, right? That's always the risk. You know, you, you overdo it. And um, in my experience, the Fed always overshoots on the upside and the downside. But, you know, meanwhile, what really matters about stocks, right, if you're an investor, um, you need profits, earnings. And earnings estimates have been going up uh, by just, of course, uh, every industry right now, not just for this year, but for next year and the following year. They're already talking 2025, guys. Yeah. That's, well, you know, uh, and markets do look out that far, apparently. The other bright side, too, is that, you know, if you think about people that are employed, you know, their wages have gone up. You know, they're still spending money. They're still traveling. Um, I actually read an article. I, I think I mentioned this last week in Philadelphia Magazine about how rents at the Jersey Shore are starting to decline. And, you know, more people are thinking, OK, I'm not going to spend all this money at the Jersey Shore. I'm going to take a trip off to Europe or something. Because it's cheaper. Yeah, it might be cheaper to go to Europe than the Jersey Shore. You know there's a problem when that's the case. I, I always say this, too, out in Montauk here in New York. I literally could go to the south of France for the weekend. It'd be cheaper. So, you know, some moderation, I think you're right, um, in the services part of the economy would be a good thing. And, you know, the one part of the economy that's been a lag, that's really been in a rolling recession, has been the good side of the economy, right? You know, you had everyone buying goods um, during the pandemic. We were sitting inside. We went from uh, buying Pelotons to going on planes because once we we're able to go out in the world again, everyone's going to restaurants, they've been traveling. And then you had all these companies buying all this inventory. And then wait a second, all the demand dried up because people didn't want camping equipment anymore. Um, but you're starting to see that change, right? Where finally people are going to start buying goods again, which means the goods parts of the economy should start to pick up as well as we move into next year. Yeah, I have to agree with you, Rye. I think, um, you know, GDP now, which does an estimate you know, down in Atlanta, they, they're estimating after the first month of the third quarter, which we're in right now, uh, they're predicting a 5.9% GDP growth rate, which is phenomenal, uh, especially since they just downgraded uh, the second quarter down to 2.1%. I don't think it's going to come in that high, but it shows you that the economy is still accelerating. I think this is more of a longer term trend. You know, we, we talk about the roaring 20s. 
um, you know, forget people talking about a recession. We're talking about literally economic uh, acceleration and growth is productivity, right? We're starting to see productivity come back. People are actually going back to offices again. I see that in my building here in New York. All of a sudden, businesses are moving in again. People are coming in. They're working. They're becoming more effective, which is disinflationary because if people are more productive, it means you need less people. You can pay those people really well. Um, so wages can continue to go higher, but it's not going to be as big a stress on companies' bottom line. So we should start to see margins expand, and we should start to see more efficiency in the marketplace. And that's where AI and a lot of this uh, you know, autonomous technology and all that is really going to kick in. It's going to be a benefit for all businesses. As a matter of fact, I was talking to a client of mine, and uh, they're in the business consulting arena. And one of the things that they were talking about is that a lot of these AI companies are really interested in purchasing their data that they've collected over the past few years. So essentially, you know, they're going to be able to use the data that they have uh, to create an AI model and essentially replace with what they're doing. Well, you know, it's like anything else, right? It's, uh, it's going to be a, a long lead time to all these promises of AI, you know, are recognized. But again, the market stocks are forward looking, right? They're not looking at the data today. They're looking out anywhere from three to 30 months on what is possible. So it's uh, if you're wondering why the market goes up long before the information gets better, that's the reason right there. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 134, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you saved over a million dollars and you want a more hands-on approach with your financial independence plan, Bob, Chris, and I will run for you. Our total financial master plan will do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review we literally look at everything. There's no firm out there that will do this work up front. In fact, we go as far as building you, your own personalized financial portal, give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, and just hone in on every financial issue you need to address today, whether it's an income plan for retirement. How should you draw from your portfolios when that paycheck stops? How do you take Social Security? There are lots of ways to take it. One right way for you. How do you factor in inflation? Your costs are going to double over the next 20 years. You need a dynamic income plan. We'll put that together for you. We're going to look at diversification. Has your portfolio been like a yo-yo the last two years as markets have been all over the place, very volatile, or have you been sitting in cash, paralysis by analysis? We're going to put together a full investment game plan, tie it to your goals, show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we're going to look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, fee-laden products, whether it's an annuity, mutual fund, brokerage products, structured products. We'll do a deep dive of every investment you own, show you how to reduce the cost and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make. It's what you take. Simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan if you've saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan to see if you qualify for a free financial review. So Chris and Bob. As we know at Payne Capital Management, of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E, and all the planning that we do for our clients, new clients, we probably run more financial plans here than like anybody else on the planet, is when it comes to solid wealth planning, you know, you really have to be the antithesis of making irrational short-term decision-making when it comes to your portfolio, when it comes to just decisions you have to make when it comes to your wealth plan. So I thought we could talk about some of that short-term decision-making that can be extremely detrimental to your long-term financial goals and you know why you need to really avoid it like the plague. Well, I'll take the first one. I'll just put my money in a 5% money market and that will get me to my financial goals. Well, you know what the problem with that is that money markets don't stay at that level forever. Like if you think about where we were just a year and a half ago, money markets were paying less than 1%. And you think about it, inflation averages 3% over time. You know, that's not going to get to your goals. So that's why you need to be invested. Yeah. You know what? Uh, I think, Brian, you always say this is the obvious trade is always the wrong trade. And <laughs> literally, I have a dozen conversations a week with clients like, well, why don't we just get rid of everything and put it into a three month T-bill at 5.4% or whatever the rate is at that time? Or, you know, hey, it's a mega tech stocks that are doing all the uh, getting all the return. Why don't we just get rid of everything and put it into the magnificent seven? So it's, uh, you know, it's momentum. It's always, you know, follow the momentum of what's obvious, and it's always going to end in tears. It's the, it's the worst thing you can possibly do. Well, I got a name for that strategy. It's called Tech and T-Bills, and it doesn't work. <laughs> tech and T-Bills. Yeah. Well, no, it is like, it's like the quote-unquote safety trade right now. And I mean, it is true, right? Like, you hear all these 
uh, strategists on TV saying like, hey, nothing wrong with getting 5% on your money right now, mm -hmm. but it, it's so short term when you're thinking about it. And Bob, you know, you came up with a pretty clever, uh, you know, idea this week. You know, you talk about the Wayne Gretzky strategy, and I think that's what we're deploying here at Paying Capital. And that is you don't want to invest on you know, where markets are today. You want to invest in where markets are going. And, you know, we talked about this in the first segment, say, look, inflation's coming down there's a good chance the Fed is going to lower interest rates next year. So next year, all of a sudden, that 5% money market fund could be paying three. Meanwhile, right now, you could be locking into to longer term bonds. You can be getting into the market while valuations are relatively cheap. You know, people are missing the boat right now, and they're thinking too short term because 5% for one year is not going to get you to your retirement goals over 20, 30 years. You know, you would think it would be easy, Guy, because it's really just common sense, right? Let's just take electronic electric vehicles right evs are the future um they're predicting how many will be out on the road years from now but the fact of the matter is you know you need to have an infrastructure right to support that um so you know why invest in companies that sell evs that sell at these astronomical pe ratios when you can invest in infrastructure companies companies that are gonna have to build out you know the infrastructure in order to support the future i mean it's so simple and those stocks are so cheap but, you know, it's not sexy, right? So when you're looking at your long-term plan, use common sense. Yeah, I, I think it's just hard uh, because everything is in the now, right? When you watch the media, uh, whatever's going on, you, you, it gets very emotional. Investing is very emotional. It's hard to see, like, what things are going to look like in 12 months from now. And odds are they're going to be a lot different than they are right now. And I think that's the biggest mistake that investors make. You know, they're, they're at the whim of what their emotions uh, are telling them as opposed to the pragmatic, rational version of what things can look like. And that's why you've got to tie all your investments back to your goals. That's the only thing that keeps you invested. If not, you're just going to be on a whim. I'm going to get out of the market. I'm going to get in the market. I'm going to sit on the sidelines for safety. And that's like not a good way to drive your 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 long term financial goals and plans. Well no, that's a good point, Ryan. You know, a lot of times I hear from, you know, especially my my friends and, and colleagues, they say, well, you know what, I'll uh, I'll call you when I have some money, then we'll do some planning. But that's the wrong idea. I mean, to, to be able to get to that goal, you know, you need to figure out, okay, how much do I spend? You know, how much do I, how much do I save every year to be able to reach that point to that I can be financially independent at some point? And that's why, you know, it's so important to lay all that out in a long-term financial plan. Well, that's the beauty about having a long-term plan is because we can give some guarantees, right? If you're going to invest for the long haul and it, based on your plan, I guarantee you you're going to live it through a recession. I guarantee you're going to go through a market that declines 40 to 50%. And it's, you know, once you have a long-term view and you have a planning-based view in terms of how you invest your money and how you save your money, it becomes pretty simple, right? Because then, you know, when you look at this volatility, which is the price of becoming wealthy, um, you know, you, you're willing to pay that price because you know it was coming, right? You, you embrace it as opposed to fearing it. Yeah, now that's a great irony of investing. Volatility is actually your friend, right? It actually gives you opportunity and it's always like really positioned as a negative. And that's where when you have a strategy and a discipline, as opposed to, again, letting your emotions, emotions run wild, um, it just makes investing so much easier, right? It's like, okay, you know, the market's down. This is when I add to the market. Uh, you know, market's up. This is when I take some profits and add to my fixed income for the long term. And, and when you do it more mechanically and based on those goals and emotionally, it's just the difference between night and day. You really do have a different viewpoint for you know the uncertainty because there's always uncertainty but it's a much easier way to embrace that uncertainty yeah and it goes back to your point like you know it takes your focus off the here and now you know which is easy to like to buy into that latest trend like technology or putting your money into some money market and really forces you to focus on to what's really important you know what am i what am i actually doing this for rather than you know trying to make the most money possible you know guys it's really simple all you have to do is have a large wealth management practice like we do and work with clients because the clients are always telling us where we shouldn't be um <laughs> early this week bob should we have all of our money in nasdaq stocks no should we have all our money in one month t-bills no um you know those 10-year municipal bonds i know they're great but they're not yielding as much as one month t-bills so it's you know, it's just it's so difficult, right, when you're bombarded with this message of the here and now, um, not to get caught up in the momentum of what's going on. Because, you know, when you get in on the momentum, you get in on the stampede, you end up getting yeah. trampled, right? You don't end up succeeding. Yeah. And so the whole idea is think long term. Yeah, I think that the simple way to look at it is things are going to change and they're going to change unexpectedly. 
right? So we focus so much time on like what's going to happen next, mm. but most of us, we don't get it right. <laughs> so yeah. I, I think you just have to be embrace the fact that things are going to change and you got to build a portfolio for retirement that no matter what happens, you have something in your portfolio that will work, right? Instead of the all or none strategy, just make sure you've got every basis covered because we don't really know how things are going to play out. We have an idea about how, what we think is going to play out, but usually it's going to be a surprise. So I think it's futile to try to predict these things. And if you can just accept that, um, you know, for example, right now, we don't really know what's going to happen with interest rates next year. If rates keep going up, great. If your money's short term, you're going to keep benefiting from that. But what if rates go down next year? And if you have all your money short term, that's going to be a big problem. That's an all or none strategy. You don't want an all or none strategy when it comes to your retirement planning. You know, what blows my mind, guys, is like, you know, people are surprised that the world's surprising. Right. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, you can't predict what, what's not known. I mean, just take paying capital management, right? We opened the firm, what, 15 years ago, 16 years ago, you know, right into the teeth of the Great Recession, the financial crisis. Um, and you know, literally every client said, Bob, I don't want to put any money in the U.S. market. I want it all in the emerging markets. I want it in Europe. I want it outside the U.S. because the U.S. is a horrible place to invest. Right. Fifteen years later, I have new clients coming in saying, I don't want anything that's not in the U.S. Matter of fact, I only want to be in those seven mega tech stocks. Right. I don't care if there's three thousand <laughs> yeah. great companies to invest in. I want to you know, I want to be in what's working now. So I don't get to think long term for, just for planning purposes, but you also have to have some perspective. Right. And 15 years ago, wasn't that long ago, guys? No, it wasn't. And we do have short term memories. I say when it comes to the weather and markets, everyone has the shortest term memory. <laughs> so it's just one of those things where you forget and I, it kind of blows my mind. But people already forget about the great financial crisis. Right. Because you have a lot of newer investors that weren't around back then. So they don't know what that felt like. Um, they, they don't remember just how traumatic it was. And, you know, even going back further, I started my career when the dot com bubble burst. And I remember when tech stocks got hammered and they got hammered for years, you know, so those things can happen again in history. You know, it doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. And I think that's one of the biggest mistake investors make is that recency bias. It's just like what's happened recently. Let's extrapolate that out to the future. And it just comes down to things are going to change in an unexpected way. You got to accept it. You got to embrace it. You got to position yourself for anything can happen. All right, it's the hidden facts of finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, attendance was still less than half of pre COVID levels across 10 of the largest US business districts as of early August, according to data from Castle Systems. That figure is roughly unchanged compared to where the start was in 2023. Still seems like a big lag with people going back to the office. Yeah, I think all you have to do is get Taylor Swift come to the business district and everybody shows up. You know, they can't, <laughs> you can't get a ticket for a show. Now they got to put it on IMAX. So, you know, if you want to get people back in the office, have Taylor come in and sing for the day. You know, Bob, I think that's the best business plan you've ever come up with in your all your years of paying capital. But I will say this, I know anecdotally here in New York, which has been hit harder than a lot of other cities, is you are actually seeing people actually come back. Like you're seeing new businesses come into our building, which has been relatively vacant for the last two years. So I think there are signs that people are going back to the office, and that's probably a good sign for the commercial real estate market long term, which has just gotten hammered here. Chris, yep. it was almost 250 years ago, the first registered family shoemaker Johann Adam Birkenstock began cobbling shoes near Frankfurt, Germany in 1774, even before our independence. That Birkenstock now looks to be going public. Recently, there was an auction of Steve Jobs' brown suede Birkenstock Arizonas not long ago that fetched $218,000. Man, the Birkenstock fad is back, and it looks like they're going to have an IPO. Pretty wild. Yeah, I remember... I remember in, uh, when you were in high school, Rye, you had a pair of Birkenstocks, and uh, I heard it's a rumor that they wanted to try and auction them off, but they smelled so bad that no one would take them. <laughs> I, I will attest to that. Um, I've never had the best smelling feet, um, but and, and I was uh, definitely probably too heavily into the Grateful Dead in high school, hence the Birkenstocks. But it, it blows my mind how something could be so unfashionable, because a couple years ago, no one went to our Birkenstocks, and now it's just like the, the high end end of fashion is... You got to wear a pair of Burks, Bob. I don't think you ever owned a pair, though. That's kind of surprising. No, I would. I wouldn't give up my Earth shoes. <laughs> I always thought Dad was an UGGs guy. <laughs> I would pay. I, I don't think I can ever picture Dad in a pair of UGGs. It just seems uh, 
It's not on. It's not on message. It's not on brand for Bob. <laughs> Maybe some suede loafers for Bob. Alonis or Ferragamo. <laughs> there you go. Um, <laughs> Bob only only wore the best Italian leather shoes when we were growing up. Um, no one was ever dressed better than Bob Payne when it came to uh, business in the '80s and '90s. So yeah, I got a lot of suits for sale. If anybody's interested. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, what another great episode of Pain Points of Wealth, episode 134. If you love our podcast, of course you love it. Please give us a five-star rating on iTunes. Leave a comment there. Let everyone else know how great we are. If you're listening to this on Spotify, you can subscribe. And this is on YouTube right now. You can like this episode. You can subscribe to our channel. Click the notification bell to be updated on all our new content. That's it for this week's Pain Points of Wealth. Stay tuned and keep an open mind.